Cisco Secure Virtual Summit. We're so glad that you could join us here today and we've got a really incredible agenda which is all aimed around helping you and your organizations succeed through changing and challenging times. My name is Nish Parker and I'm a Security Communications Manager here at Cisco and I'm excited to be joined by Jason Wright to host this event. Thanks Nish, I'm really glad to be here as well. We've got some really great speakers that are going to be joining us today throughout the day uh, in addition to one of my good friends, G. Rittenhouse, the SVP and GM of the Security Business Unit, we have Megan Rapino, who is the captain of the U.S. National Women's Soccer Team. And in addition to that, she's also a gold medal Olympian and has uh, been going around and, and having some conversations and doing some motivational speaking and, and becoming a, a bit of an activist as well. And so she's going to talk to us a little bit about what it's like to be in crunch time, what you need to do execute successfully both on and off the field in our professional lives and in our personal lives. So it's going to be a great show and I'm excited to hear from both of these guests today. It's going to be an amazing session. We'll then be joined by Teresa Payton, who's a hugely influential cybersecurity professional. She's the CEO and president of Fortalis and also the first ever female CIO of the White House. Her and I caught up, caught up a couple of weeks ago to talk about resilience and practice self-care. We talked about how to overcome cybersecurity fatigue, and we also caught up on her new book. It's called Manipulated, Inside the Cyber War to Hijack Elections and Distort the Truth. Yeah, so in addition to executives and athletes, we have authors that are participating. And if you're in the US and you wanna have a chance to earn a copy of Teresa Payton's book, or a chance to win one of our new Cisco SecureX hoodies, because no good hacker goes without a hoodie, then all you have to do is sign up for our newsletter. The link is there on the screen. Get signed up and we'll stay in touch with you and make sure that you're eligible to win one of these two prizes. And if you're already a loyal subscriber to our newsletter, you're still eligible. Just complete the form to opt in. And then after Nish and Teresa's session, we'll jump into a session with John Olsick from ESG and Jeff Reed, our Senior VP of Security Products. Talk about the importance of integrated security. Yes, and it's so great to have him on because integration is really at the cornerstone of Cisco's new Cisco Secure strategy. As a company, we're all really in and all in in connecting products and solutions, including third party APIs. Now, I love that we have an analyst on because it's a great perspective, it's an objective perspective on what cybersecurity professionals and organizations are prioritizing right now. Yes, and you're all probably familiar with SecureX that we launched at Cisco Live US. We're very excited about this. It's absolutely a game changer. This is our new integrated security platform. So John and Jeff are going to speak to a little bit about what that means for the industry. And then afterwards, I'm going to jump in and give you a quick seven or eight minute demonstration of SecureX and show you how you can get these automated security workflows working on your behalf for you instantaneously how you can gain better visibility and showcase how you can work with all of your security technologies so that you ultimately have a more efficient security experience with your security infrastructure, because that's what SecureX is all about. Super exciting. And to close, we have a customer fireside chat on the strategic CISO. We'll be joined by customers Lou Saviano from Skillsoft and Cisco's own CISO, Steve Martino, who are gonna be chatting about how they've been coping with them themselves and their organizations during these uncertain times. They'll also share advice for new cybersecurity professionals and why it's so important to have a simplified approach when it comes to cybersecurity. So it's shaping up to be a really great day. And without further ado, let's hit the pitch with Megan Rapino and G Rittenhouse. Welcome everyone to our keynote on the topic of playing to win the importance of teamwork, overcoming adversity, and trailblazing in uncertain times. My name is G. Rittenhouse, and I'm honored to introduce our very special guest today. For those of you who are fans of the world's game, or as we call it here in the States, soccer, you already know her. Uh, for the very few that don't, she is a two-time Olympian, winning the gold medal in the 2012 London Games. She is a three-time FIFA Women's World Cup participant, winning two golds and one silver. Let me just say, you and Sue just crushed it uh, at this year's ESPYs. 
Finally, she is a wonderful individual, a tremendous activist. Please join me in giving a huge virtual welcome to Megan Rapino. Megan, how are you? I'm, uh, I'm doing pretty well. I mean, as, much, as well as you can do in uh, a moment we have never seen before and likely <laughs> in our lifetime we'll never see again, hopefully. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm overall uh, managing and, and doing pretty well. I feel very lucky. Megan, thank you for joining us today. It, it, uh, get, like you say, it must be in a, a very strange time for you. Given the shortened season, you've probably given a million of these virtual interviews. You're much better at it than, than I am. I see you everywhere on TV, your channel. You've just been crushing it. Uh, but imagine right now there are 80,000 people clapping for you. You can't hear them, but they are there right there with you. Welcome. I just want to give you some uh, background about uh, the audience and, and where we're coming from. Today's audience is just full of cybersecurity professionals. And, and the two things that you should know about them are one, that this group faces active adversaries, you, you probably hear them in the news, that are trying to steal or ransom bank account information, company data, hospital records. They're right on the front lines protecting uh, those communities. And, and second, they come from an amazingly diverse set of backgrounds. There, there's no one way of becoming a security professional, one career path and whatnot. They grow up doing so many things and then are attracted to security. And when I heard that you were coming, uh, it reminded me so much of your career. When, when you were growing up, you know, basketball, track, soccer, all these things. Uh, tell us a little bit of like, how did you get to, soccer when you're you were know, so talented at so many different ones i mean i think i was always most talented at soccer maybe i was talented when i was younger at those other things but i think that would have fizzled out um, pretty quickly but my older brother played soccer um you know back i guess when i was growing up i think it was a, a growing sport but it really obviously has grown so much since then um so it wasn't super popular and from a pretty small town um, in Northern California. So, you know, just played in the rec leagues and all that, but we didn't even really have like a competitive team, like the, like the top level competitive team in Reading. So ended up having to travel to that, but there was always just this sense of, I, I like the team sports, I think better, but I feel like in soccer, you get to do both. It's, it's very much kind of an individual thing. Um, and you get to express yourself and sort of have your very, unique personality show on the field while also being uh, a part of a bigger team. So it always just, I think it was the, the freedom of it as well. There's not that many rules. I always would forget the plays in basketball and, you know, like I don't, baseball had too many rules and softball and it was too slow. So uh, I think there's a, a sense of freedom that I feel on the soccer field that, you know, drew me in then and that uh, I still feel to this day. And so it's just the, the classic story, the older brother setting up cones, making you do uh, drills and pushing you hard. Uh, and, and by the way, I mean, the, the individual uh, team, uh, we're going to hold that thought because uh, we're going to come back to that because uh, you're essentially famous about that point. In addition to being a, a champion, you're also a, a leader. Um, was that always true as well? Or, or was there a, a time, a, you know, a coach or a play where people just started looking to you a, as that leader? No, I don't think I'm, I, no, not from a very young age. I wasn't like, you know, I was always a twin as well. And, and Rachel was much more um, of the leader, I think, um, amongst us, especially as we got kind of into middle school and high school. Um, she was, you know, sort of the more assertive one and I just kind of like followed her and I was perfectly happy to just be in, be in her shadow and be able to kind of follow in her footsteps. Um, but I think as I've gotten older, I, you know, sort of matured into myself and then really like what happened on the national team, like everybody retired. So then all of a sudden <laughs> I went from being like, just sort of like a middle age player in the, you know, sort of one younger ones, but like growing up and then all of a sudden you know, me and a few other players, we were like, <laughs> I guess we're the, I guess we're the veterans. And so then it took, you know, a little bit of time to really kind of grow and mature into that role. And, you know, having the benefit also 
The national team is just a little different because, you know, some players have been on there one year, two years, mm-hmm. three years, and they might be a starter on the team, might be one of the best players. But to have the knowledge of, you know, a long career on the national team and how to navigate things, um, I think, like, you sort of just naturally, uh, by osmosis even, like, just get that sort of leadership. You kind of know the ropes and you can help people, um, you know, bring along. And then I think couple that with what this team has taken on off of the field, um, you know, things I'm very passionate about, but also feel very comfortable um, speaking out. I think those two kind of mended together a little bit, um, especially in the last couple of years, um, has kind of put me in that leadership position. I'm also impressed on how the team brings in the young players and, and not just in, you know, at the end where the where the game is already decided, but like in key situations, you have that young group in there as well that then can gain that experience and continue through the evolution. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the, um, the sort of putting the young player into a position where it's like, what can you handle at whatever age? We're not going to ask our young player to also, you know, be one of the, you know, leaders on the team and always be talking to the media and going back and forth with the coaches. And so it's like, we don't, we don't ask that. And I think like older players, just because you've been around more, you have a little bit more comfortability or capacity with that. Whereas like, all we really want to do is can get the best out of everyone. So as a young player, like, they do need to be more carefree. Like I remember even just my experiences from, you know, my first World Cup to now, I'm like, oh my God, I just was like, this is awesome. You know, you just get to kind of show up and play and and then going through this one, I'm like, oh my God, there's so much more behind the scenes than I ever knew. And, but I wouldn't have been able to handle it back then. I wouldn't have known even what to do. And now, you know, it's it's easier in that sense but also it's like you need those players to be you need that carefreeness because if everyone was trying to do everything all the time it would be just a big mess yeah i'm sure i mean i've never experienced it but for me just walking on a field in front of a hundred thousand people just would be (laughs) that's an experience you have to get used to in and of itself uh for sure it's it's incredible um, one of, besides the uh, the teamwork, it's you know we're also focusing on overcoming adversity and, and trailblazing. Um, persistence uh, in the face of cyber threats is, is such a key part of our industry. You make it look so easy uh, as a world class athlete and, and champion, even on the biggest moments like. Like the the penalty kick uh, in in the finals. I mean, like, what goes on in your head when like everything stops, everything is focused on you at the biggest times? How, how do you deal with that? I mean, to be honest, speaking of cybersecurity, I feel like when I get, um, you know, like a oh Snapchat, here's your verification code. I get more freaked out about that because I'm like, who's trying to get in the I don't even Snapchat. That's don't why. click I'm, on it. No, I'm like, who's trying to get in there? Um, I mean, I think to, a lot of it is practice. You know, I, I've gone through a lot of these moments, and it, it's impossible to replicate being in the most pressurized moment. But I always try to at least to myself, like verbalize the worst possible thing that can happen. Like the worst thing that could happen was, you know, we're in the, you know, World Cup final and we get a penalty kick and we're in, you know, a shootout and I'm the last one. And like, I lose the World Cup for my team. Mm-hmm. I mean, what are you going to do? It's like, that'd be <laughs> terrible. I would hate that, but I don't know. It's like, you know, I've, I've been fortunate to win most of the games in my career. I've also lost a lot and lost some big ones, lost, you know, two club championships and lost in an Olympics and lost in a World Cup final. So, you know, I kind of just try to take it as it comes. And, um, you know, I think routine as well in those moments really helped me. So I just try to do the same thing every time. I think it's almost like a meditative process of just trying to calm down and taking myself out of the moment almost and and just you know focusing on what is in front of me and then just yeah just relying i guess on a lot of practice and talent and 
hoping for the best. And if it goes horribly wrong, I guess it just goes horribly wrong. But it normally doesn't. So I, I, I'm I like probably every kid have always done like three, two, one, and make. But that's very different than actually standing up and doing it. So that's incredible. And. In terms of persistence, you know, early in your career, sophomore year, you you tore your ACL, come back in your junior year, a couple games in, it happens again. Like uh, that, that how, how do you just sit there and go like, I got it, um, like work through that, I'm going to come back yet a third time. Like, you know, that just is a lot of mental fortitude that, take seasons off just to train like that. How do you do that? I think I have like some kind of short-term memory loss with things, honestly, because I get asked this a lot. Um, I think the way that I try to approach it is like a, uh, a sort of day by day, week by week. I think you can get very easily overwhelmed if you're trying to solve the whole thing or you know, contextualize the whole thing at one time, particularly with an injury with an athlete. Yeah, your whole life changed, you know, um, you know, you're in a way your whole life is taken away. This is, you know, something in you know, especially when I got injured as a pro. It was like, this isn't my livelihood. This is potentially my career. This is everything I've worked for. This might be the end of my career. What does that mean? This is my financial security, all of that. So I really do try to take it back to like, what can I do today? And what am I focused on this week? And then, you know, I think if you get into that groove and, and sometimes of course I'm, you know, sitting there on the couch wallowing and just <laughs> a big pile of nothing. But I think when I start to get into that groove, I get two and three and four months down the road. And, you know, you're sort of the, the culmination of all these days that, you've put in a lot of work and focused on and you're that much closer to your goal. And you can kind of look at what you can do and what you have done as opposed to everything you can't do yet. Mm -hmm. And so that helps me personally. I think otherwise it's way too overwhelming and stressful to, to live in that space. You know, with some of my knee injuries, it's like, okay, you can't play for six to nine months. If every day I'm thinking I can't play, I can't play, I can't play, then it's like going to be a terrible existence. So what can you do in the moment? Um, what other things can you focus on as well? I've, I've always been a big believer in, I mean, I'm, I just have a lot more passions and um, interests outside of soccer as well. I think soccer is very fulfilling in so many ways and has brought me all over the world. I'll forever be thankful, but it isn't my whole life. And it, it can be, especially as you get older, a little redundant in ways. So where am I challenging myself? What areas am I um, growing in. And certainly when you have an injury, you have a little bit more time on your hands, to do that kind of stuff. So taking advantage of those moments as well to, to keep growing as a person outside of soccer, I think is really important for me and not just getting like sucked into the one thing. Yeah, no, I think that's, I think that's great advice. Uh, just on that point, um, like w when you do that, do you, do you have a, a goal? Um, one of the things that uh, cybersecurity professionals are really passionate about is that protective role that you know they they are standing in between uh these attackers and protecting do you have a, a similar goal as you're trying to go through this i want to be here by then or is it just enjoy the recovery and and try to work your way through it yeah i definitely think there's an an end goal um, I think, you know, for talking about my knee injury, it's obviously you want to get back on the field, but I think in order to really reach your goal, I really did try to break down, like, how did we even get here? What are we, what are we overcoming? So I don't, I think if you don't understand the problem, so to speak, then, you know, you might get six months down the road, but maybe the same problem still exists that you didn't address. That's going to put you at more risk for injury or more risk for um, you know, a, a security attack or whatever it is. So really like breaking down the process and understanding each kind of like foundational building block that you're working with, with this big goal in mind. So for me, of course, it's always getting back out on the field and being strong, but what caused this breakdown to begin with? Is there an area on my body that, you know, was overcompensating and it just 
took it no longer. And so how do I build that area back? Maybe it's a mechanics thing. Maybe it's just a, you know, a, a muscle thing or a strength thing. So kind of really like breaking everything down to then when you come back, like I didn't want to just come back the same thing. And that's kind of impossible. Like, how can we come back better? How can we come back more safe and stronger and, and put in a position that this doesn't happen again? That's a great point. Um, changing gears a little bit to the trailblazing part of the conversation. Um, one of the things I've always enjoyed uh, watching you and the team in soccer is the individual celebration after the goal, but then again, coming together as that team. And I, and I think you said it so well earlier, This your love about it is this kind of individualness and the team piece. Um, you had an I iconic pose after the, the free kick uh, against France. And, uh, that that smile on your face is just uh, you're just pure joy. But then once you got in with the teammates, I mean, there was a completely different persona. Um, where did the pose come from? Is that something that like you rehearse in front of the mirror and really kind of get it down? Is that spontaneous? How does that happen? Um, I did it one time before leaving for the World Cup um, in a friendly we had in um, Denver against Australia, I think. Um, I don't know where it came from, to be <laughs> honest, where the, where the original thought to do it was. Um, I mean, make no mistake, I like attention and I do not shy <laughs> away from it. And I view myself as, of course, I'm an athlete, that's obvious, but I view myself as an entertainer um, in, a, in a big way. I mean, I think sports are incredible for all the things they bring out but like you want it to be fun if i'm gonna be in front of like and commit my life and you know sacrifice all this time that i have to do training alone and all of that like i don't train alone so you know i can get in front of all these people and not do anything i never understood that i think too like i haven't been the player that's always scored a lot of the goals and I never understood when people score the goal that's the whole point of the game and they're just like yeah i scored mm -hmm. the goal I'm like, this is the whole point of, of the game and just a chance to have fun and really kind of ham it up. So I think in that moment, I mean, that post sort of became, you know, uh, had a life of its own in so many ways with the controversy that preceded it and mm -hmm. the stress and the pressure in the tournament and what was happening in the tournament and beyond and around the world and all of that. So it kind of it, it did something all its own. But yeah, I definitely was like, I'm in a crowd full of, you know, basically 80% French people who are dying to beat the United States. And they just know that they can't. And like, they hate me for scoring, but they also like, they kind of like it. And so I'm like, you kind of like what's happening. And like, you're rooting for us because our team stands for so much, but it's like, we're going against your team. So there's so many dynamics going on. You have to, you have to enjoy the, you know, the cauldron while you're in it, I think. Well, with all the extra stuff going on, uh, it, it, for me, it captured this, uh, there was always a, a, a bit of a suggestion that perhaps you and the rest of the uh, American team uh, wouldn't be able to win. And um, th that expression just put away all doubt uh, at that time. It was, no doubt uh, where you and the team were going and and the celebration with your teammates just made it clear that uh, this was a team effort that um, nothing's going to stand in your way. Uh, I, I really at that time, we didn't know, I guess, who was going to play you next. But uh, there was no doubt that there was uh, it wasn't going to even be close. So it, it, it was a perfect moment. It was a perfect no, moment and it did cool. set you up. That's the kind of I'm cool sorry. thing about scoring a goal as well. It's like, a, of course, one person scores the goal. So they get this kind of like initial moment. But then, you know, being the, the person that has not scored the goal a lot or assisted or whatever, like when everyone does come together, like everyone knows that everyone had to be involved. And it's like, it is the whole point of the game. So if you were the one that, you know, the defender that made the tackle that led to the play to score the goal, you feel just as much a part of it as anyone else. So it's like, there's like the two celebrations that get to happen. And it, it really is a special moment. 
That that's awesome, and of course, it also uh, has been able to give you a global platform. Uh, you have a lot of other passions. You're promoting diversity and equal pay, uh, diversity, uh, and um, you know, systemic racism. These, these things are like front and center uh, right now. Diversity in the in the security space is especially critical. Um, because, of, of course, the adversaries that we face, they're diverse from that perspective. And so we have to have a, a, a community of minds on how to deal with this. Um, you've been promoting um, young women and all the way you know, down to girls through soccer. You've been dealing with systemic racism. How, how do you deal, like bring these other issues to front uh, on your platform? Well, I look at it not as different issues. I feel like they're all sort of the same issues. So if we, you know, look at kind of like a, a real zoomed out view of society or what, you know, systemic racism is or just a, you know, a society founded on white supremacy, if you want to see that, it's also a society founded on, um, you know, patriarchy. And so having the, the male at the center of everything or, um, you know, being able-bodied um, and so you start to get into intersectionality where these things cross so what if you know you're a, a gay female athlete instead of just a female athlete or instead of just a male athlete or what if you have a disability what if you have a disability and you're black what if you are um you know an undocumented person and you're gay all of these things i think to me feel like the same thing it's the the idea that really society was kind of only set up for one thing and everyone else just kind of has to fit into it so how do we start to peel back the layers on that i mean certainly racism um and systemic racism is at the at the root i think of of everything and so that is like you know priority number one in terms of being dismantled but even you know within that we see um you know trans community um you know being murdered at disproportionate rates so how do we start to deal with that how do we start to deal with the patriarchy you know within our own systems and our own communities our own life to kind of break that down so i feel like as i've started and you know in my kind of younger careers i started to talk about gay rights and came out and then we started talking about equal pay little dots were connected there and certainly in 2016, you know, kneeling with with Colin Kaepernick really kind of solidified that feeling for me of like, OK, it's, it's actually just all connected. Um, you know, if if we if we can't see that in another person, how do we break everything down? So at times I've asked people to, you know, be my ally or to stand up for me in gay rights. Then I'm like, OK, then that's me kind of doing the same the same kind of thing for someone else and it, it, you don't have to walk a mile in someone's shoes but you do have to believe them and i think that's where you know we start to get into people's different perspectives and like i don't know what it, it what it's like to be black and i never will i will never understand that i'll never go through anything but i can believe the black person who's telling me what they're going through and so i kind of look at things from that p perspective it's like if someone's telling you something about their experience that is the truth that that is their experience so kind of going at it from that and so when when i do talk about i mean i feel like i can talk about any sort of issue around equality because we don't have equality in this country for a lot of different reasons and they're all very interconnected so i think i i sort of found that in 2016 as like the the foundation for for me even talking about equality in any sense yeah, and that was an incredible stand that you took. I would imagine, perhaps, uh, you know, even coming as you said from Reading and in, in a different part of the the world, you know, identifying yourself like that uh, is a big is a big step, um, and and one that you didn't shy away from. So, we all applaud you for that. Um, are, for the benefit of the the folks listening, are, are there ways that you found for them to get engaged and for them to participate and, and, and get active? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a million different ways how long how long we had to talk about it. But I, I think the first thing really is to educate yourself, um, because when we think about racism, I think a lot of people think about it in terms of the interpersonal racism. So am, do, am I racist towards you or are you racist towards me or your coworker, your family? Are you saying slurs? Are you saying these things? And that's one aspect of racism, but the whole society is really set up to benefit one particular group of people over another. And as a white person, we do have white privilege. And that doesn't mean that we didn't work hard. It doesn't mean that your life wasn't hard, all of these things. It just wasn't harder because of the color of your skin. So in starting to understand some of these themes, I guess, for lack of better, throughout society, we can then combat it. Um, and, and the idea around not just you know, being not racist yourself, but actually being anti-racism, which means wherever you see it, you root it out and try to balance out the equation. So, you know, there's great books. Um, you know, we're, we're uh, lucky here in Seattle to have Ijeoma Alua, who wrote an amazing book a couple of years ago called, you want to talk, so you want to talk about race, um, which, which does a huge labor for us in breaking things down and, and us starting to, to understand. Um, white fragility is a great one. Um, and then I think for for white people, no matter how far you're into the movement or not, maybe you're brand new, maybe you've been in it a while, really listening to the people who are leading the movement. Um, you know, black queer women in particular um, have always been at the, you know, the, the core of every movement. And they haven't really gotten the credit um, that they deserve. But what are they saying? What is, you know, the leaders of Black Lives Matter saying or Black Future Collective or different activists or people and to really kind of take this time to listen and to learn and then so when you do step into the conversation you have kind of an educational base and like we're gonna mess up we're we're gonna say something wrong um and that's okay that can't stop us from trying and it's it's difficult because it does challenge everything we really have been taught about this country and our history and um, you know, what this country was founded on, life, liberty, you know, justice, the pursuit of happiness, everybody is created equal. And that was not the, not the whole story, certainly. And so, you know, it's, it's okay that um, that might be uncomfortable for, for you, but let's, let's learn the real history. Let's understand how these things came to be so we can see them when it's happening and then work to, to break them down. Fabulous advice, Megan. Uh, I want to just thank you for your your time, giving us you know such great insights on teamwork, perseverance, and of course trailblazing in the face of uh, opposition. Uh, fantastic. Thank you so much for spending time with us today, and uh, just stay safe. Looking forward to seeing you get back out on the soccer field and. All, all of your other pursuits. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Wow, what an incredible session. Megan shared some really great insights and experiences, and I know for sure that she inspired me, and I'm sure she inspired many of you too. I love that she touched on inclusivity, and I thought that tied in really well to Cisco's new purpose, which is around powering an inclusive future for all. So next up, I was super lucky a couple of weeks ago to catch up with Teresa Payton. We discussed what the cybersecurity landscape looks like today, including how to navigate these challenging times. And I loved hearing her predictions for tomorrow. Let's roll the clip. Security is top of mind for everyone right now, and now more than ever. I'm so excited to be joined by a talented author of three books and the first female CIO of the White House, Teresa Payton. Teresa, thank you so much for joining us and welcome. I'm really looking forward to what you have to share. So Teresa, take it away. Hi everybody. I'd like to think that I know a thing or two about emergency planning, but with COVID-19, all bets are off. But as the former White House Chief Information Officer and someone who makes a living planning for and executing resiliency and recovery plans during unthinkable disasters from my time in banking Hurricane Andrew to 9-11. 
I'm constantly in something I like to refer to as reimagining mode. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a minute. But at the center of it all, I think about resiliency, both of the mission and operations, but also securing the people by designing for them and also thinking about their resiliency and my own. Now, when COVID-19 happened, um, I wanna share with you a little quote that I really have been thinking about a lot as we're in this pandemic, moving to post-pandemic and post-pandemic execution mode. The pain you feel today is the strength you feel tomorrow. So for every challenge encountered, there is an opportunity for growth. So as dire as things got, I see a lot of hope for the future and I wanna share that hope with you. And as businesses necessarily reimagine their operations for this post COVID era, cyber criminals will do the same. So as we know, countries around the world were forced to shut down, to flatten the curve, and they did just that. Um, and everyone is racing for a cure to give our public health infrastructure a chance to absorb the cases, but also to hopefully successfully treat and successfully cure anybody co who comes down with it and to prevent it in the future. But for many businesses, revenues declined dramatically. And for some businesses, revenues evaporated with very little notice. But what didn't evaporate for them was fixed costs, any debt, any brick and mortar, technology infrastructure, all of which was sitting idle for some period of time. So as businesses start to transform their operations, as I've learned over the years, cyber criminals are never gonna let a good crisis go to waste. So let's talk about reimagining. You know, it's a term that Disney uses, and I'm a huge Disney fan. As a matter of fact, my family and I run every year in the Star Wars Disney races at Walt Disney World. And of course, due to COVID-19, those races were necessarily canceled. We ran them virtually, though, and earned our medals. But reimagining is that term that Disney uses to describe how they adapt, reorient, and change business operations, anything from storylines to rides, to merchandise and more. And oftentimes it's driven by internal forces. This time Disney will most likely be reimagining due to an external force of COVID-19. A reimagining alters an original process or idea in such a major way that in my words, it becomes a supercharged remake. COVID-19 became in 2020, a gold mine of opportunity also for cybercrime. So as businesses were sending employees home to work, and by the way, I have to say, Cisco, what a great job you did. Many of my clients got a call from you. You offered WebEx to them for free so that they could communicate with their clients and with their employees, and it worked like a champ. So I have to give a plug here for like what an amazing greater good thing that you did as people were going through this crisis. But as they were, these cyber criminals struck. Our phones at Fortalis were buzzing and ringing every day with crisis calls. Cyber intrusions such as unauthorized logins, business email compromise resulting in huge amounts of wire transfer fraud, and ransomware attacks against operations were accelerating at a dizzying pace. I've never seen anything like it. So we're approaching mid-year, how does 2020 end? I mean, where are cyber criminals gonna go once we lock down their ability to use these methods? You have the research, we know what they're doing, so now we know what the fix is. Cyber operatives always go to the nexus of innovation and where the action is. So as businesses are reimagining and introducing innovation post COVID-19, cyber criminals are gonna be ready to take full advantage. Boardrooms and C-suites are accelerating the transformation roadmaps to make up for lost time and lost revenue. So as we transform our previous interactions to contactless transactions and virtual experiences, the crimes will necessarily transform. Again, I wanna go back to sort of this concept of reimagining. I love this quote from Walt Disney. I actually took a picture of it the last time I was at uh, Disneyland, and it was on one of the walls, and it said, when we consider a new project, 
we really study it, not just the surface idea, but everything about it. That's gonna be key as we go into where are we headed next with innovation? Where will the cyber criminals be? And then how do we think about resiliency of the operation and of you as an individual? So let's talk about some of the predictions I have for 2021. And by the way, I revealed almost all of these predictions, except for the first bullet point, at the end of 2019. I always like to look beyond the next year to give out predictions every year and then hold myself accountable as to whether or not I was right or wrong. And what I can tell you is, is I did not predict COVID-19. So that one I did not have. So my first prediction is the innovations that we're doing right now and that we will continue to do, and it's gonna be a very exciting time in technology, but those innovations will lead to new innovations in cybercrime. So if we thought we had it all figured out before, um, it's all gonna change on us. The next prediction that I have is that 5G will actually accelerate cybercrime. So as we move to 5G networks everywhere and enabling internet of everything on those 5G networks, my prediction is that the cyber criminals will be there and potentially that a smart city could be held for ransom that is moved to 5G and internet of everything. The next thing on my list of predictions is that misinformation campaigns will hit global elections yet again. So as you think about not only are we innovating in business, but governments are innovating, innovating as well. So one of the things we're innovating is how will people feel about standing in line on election day? Will people be willing to actually stand at the polls? Will more people take advantage of early voting? And will some people take advantage because of their health issues and concerns of absentee ballots and voting by mail? So it's my belief system that misinformation campaigns will hit the global elections again. Next, AI poisoning will be a thing. As we move towards more contactless service within service delivery to customers, one of the things I see companies talking about accelerating is their artificial intelligence usage. One area where artificial intelligence is used are customer service chatbots, for example, but there are other places it's used as well. My belief system is, as we rush to transform and implement AI, there will be poisoning of either the data used to build those algorithms or tampering of the algorithms themselves. And because AI is designed to operate as a black box, it's going to be hard to distinguish whether or not things are working as designed and haven't been tampered with. My next prediction is that ransomware will go all in on the cloud. Again, as businesses accelerate their innovation and transformation efforts, it's my belief they're gonna take a lot more advantage of the cloud than they ever have in the past. And because they're gonna be transforming their operations with the cloud, cyber criminals will be right there looking to take advantage of actually locking up the operations with a ransomware attack. And then my last bonus prediction for 2021, which I don't have on the slide, is that my new book, Manipulated, will be a number one bestseller. I'm just kidding. But anyways, I thought, thought I'd throw that bonus in there. Let's talk about your resiliency plan. So now that we, you kind of have an idea of where I think cybercrime is going to head as you're transforming your operations, I wanna talk about the resiliency plans that need to be updated. So if you look, for example, at this picture, you can look at this picture and see scary barriers, or you can look at that picture and say, I wanna be on the other side of that. So those are merely milestones. And so as CEOs, boards, and you think beyond the pandemic, see these as milestones. So what, what needs to be done, if you think about how your operations and how your processes worked pre-COVID-19, they necessarily have to change. It's gonna be a different environment. Sort of the new normal will constantly be changing on us, right? There will be interim changes and stages of the new normal. This is an opportune time to seize massive levels of innovation in your operations. And businesses who don't choose it for themselves, you may find that it's mandated for you by government 
organizations meaning well, telling customers, you know, how they have to interact with you, for example, or whether or not you're allowed to operate at 50%, 75%, or 30% capacity, or maybe you're not allowed to operate at all. Be thinking about also customer behaviors, at least for a period of time, are very different than they were at the beginning of 2020. During periods of disruption, this is a great time for innovation, but your burnout potential is a very real threat. So we know cyber criminals are not gonna give up, but oftentimes when I look at organizations' resiliency plans, they do not account for having to run from business as usual to a resiliency plan and accounting for potential employee burnout. So there's exciting innovations going on and there's going to be ongoing systemic change. The stakes are really high and cyber criminals are gonna be right there trying to reap rewards. Given the rapid pace, businesses will be reimagining operations. What that means is the future of security and how we think about things has to change. Business continuity and resiliency plans are evolving right now. So as you're updating your plans, this is the time to put into that plan the human, yourself, and all of the people that'll be supporting the resiliency plan. So let's talk about self-care and space to generate ideas. Your resiliency plans must include you. And if you're thinking to yourself, I don't think we have in there how we're gonna avoid burnout when we're in a crisis. Like those two don't seem to go together. Well, guess what? They actually do. Um, so I wanna talk to you a little bit about self-care. First of all, there's no perfect work-life formula. So as your company is reimagining your new normal and your new business model, the technology strategy that supports that, and you're thinking about the security strategy that goes with it, it's really important to be thinking about how you're going to have human resiliency. So there's a phrase I want to remove from work conversations, work-life balance, get rid of that phrase. The reason why I don't like that term is work-life balancing sort of implies everybody else has it figured out except for you because like you're a loser or something and you can't figure this out. It's not work-life balance. It's work-life choices. Um, I don't want to put an unfair burden on everyone to think there's some type of balancing act that goes on. So I want you to, I'm going to share with you something very personal to me, which is how I try to make it all work. And I have to say, Life is perfectly imperfect for me at pretty much all times, and I wouldn't trade it. I wouldn't trade it for anything. So what do I do to hold myself accountable to work-life choices, as I call them? I actually have a system called my five Fs. Now, it may only be four Fs for you, and the system that I have for me may not work for you, but I wanna share it with you. And the system that I use creates space for what I call the three Rs, renewal, recharging and reimagining. And you have to make time and space for this. So what I've done is my five Fs are faith, family, fellowship in community service, friends, and fighting to protect people. So what are you fighting for at work? We spent a lot of time at work. So it's gotta be rewarding and it's gotta be your passion. So those are my five Fs, guess what I do? actually color code my calendar. Each one of those Fs has a color. And at the end of the month, I hold myself accountable. And if I find myself spending a lot more time on work than I am on some of the other things, I make a commitment to myself and I book the time in my calendar. That's how you create space for the three R's for renewal, recharging, and reimagining. Just a little bit more personally on this. Look, I, I don't know about you, but sometimes it's hard to define a self-care routine when you're in the middle of a resiliency execution operation and coming out of that. So here are the things that I'm doing that's a little different that you may wanna consider for yourself. I'm getting up a little earlier. I've got two rescue great Pyrenees, three kids, husband, we're all working here under one roof. So I get up a little earlier to get a jump on the day. I make sure I always get my run in. I make sure I have time for meditation and prayer. On the weekends, my daughter, who's 11, she and I usually are traveling for soccer. Instead, we're baking and picking up groceries for neighbors and family members 
who are older and who are immunity system compromised. And this is a way for us to take our minds off things, but to also check in on other people and to see a smile on their face when we drop something off on the porch, honk the horn and they come out and they wave. During the work in the school week, we actually sit down the night before, we schedule time. When are we all taking a break for dinner? And we all take that break time together. We actually watched The Last Dance with Michael Jordan. And then lastly, my advice is each week may be different for you. My advice is just keep at it and find a routine and find a system that works well for you. I also wanna remind you that it's not a sign of weakness to talk to someone and tell them you feel anxious or you feel nervous or you just can't sleep. I mean, if, if you don't feel like yourself, if you don't feel like your normal self, please seek help. You may have an EAP program that you can access. It'll be confidential, it'll be free. Reach out to an old friend, reach out to a family member. If you need an outlet, reach out to me on LinkedIn. We're all part of the good guys, right? We've got to stick together and be there to support each other and cheer each other on. And then lastly, just real quick on the book, if you want to read a book or make sure your family and friends read a book that helps them make sense of all the misinformation and manipulation campaigns regarding COVID-19, international issues, and yes, all the different elections happening around the globe, you can buy the new book. It's an ebook format, audio format, and hard copy. And just remember, let's all stick together. We're in this together. We're part of the good guys. Cisco, I can't thank you enough for giving me the opportunity today to spend time with everybody. Um, again, I, I just encourage you to reach out to me on LinkedIn if I can be of service to you. And now I'll turn it back over to Cisco. Teresa, thank you so much. That was fascinating, educational, insightful, future looking and most of all human. And you, I'm sure that you've inspired many that are uh, here watching with us, but you certainly inspired me. So what I loved was what you said about reimagining and you mentioned Disney as a source of inspiration for that. So I'm really interested to hear what else or who else inspires you. No, thank you. I, um, you know, I mean, Walt Disney, I'm a huge fan of Walt Disney and even the Pixar model, how they do things in teams and small cells and they're constantly holding themselves accountable. They do the little shorts, which is for innovation and they test out different theories. You know, the other inspiration I have is from my own family. Um, we come from a long line of US military and law enforcement. And so that protect and defend uh, runs throughout sort of the fabric of the family. And so that really inspires me to, to get up and think about protecting and defending others. That's wonderful and heartwarming to hear. And actually, I feel like I've grown personally, professionally in just the last few minutes. So thank you for that. Um, and what I loved most about your talk was hearing the positivity and the experiences that you shared what's through what is quite a challenging time for many. So I look forward to continuing the conversation. Those of us that are based in the US, you can enter the competition and win a copy of Teresa's book. So lucky you. Uh, thank you so much, Teresa, again for joining us and take care, everyone. Thanks for having me and um, please have me back. I really enjoyed my time with everybody. I'm sure we will. Thanks. Okay, we'll be right back. Enjoy this quick break. Oh, hi there. You know, as a Chief Information Security Officer, a CISO, I'm helping our company take its next big leap forward. And you know, it does feel just like that. Mostly. Because these days, cybersecurity isn't only an IT thing, it's a business thing, since basically all businesses run on technology. Maintaining security that's in step with our company's growth has become furiously complex. That's because digital transformation and cloud expansion actually expand our tech surface. So we install another new security tool, which is usually not integrated, creating yet another set of metrics to watch, analyze, and administer. It's like herding security cats and dogs and hamsters. It was getting out of hand until we found Cisco Secure X. Secure X is the cloud native connective tissue that brings all of our security products together. Now there's better visibility across our infrastructure and we've automated some of our workflows to help our teams. Plus there's fewer silos and more collaboration because our tools are more integrated. 
Secure X comes as part of our Cisco products, so it just feels simpler. It works. Okay, let's put this puppy to bed, shall we? Oh, yeah. Why are all my security metaphors animal metaphors? Can't help myself. Up next, we've got our very own Jeff Reed, SVP of products, and John Oltzik from ESG, our analyst guest, who are going to talk about what they've seen in the industry and how things have changed and what's driving our future together as a, a group of products that need to work together a little bit more. So be sure as an audience that you're typing in your questions into the live chat menu. And with that, I'll turn things over to Jeff and John. Guys, take it away. Great. Hey, thank, thanks so much, Jason and John. Welcome. It's good to be here, Jeff. Good to see you again. So, so look, we've got a really interesting piece of research that you just completed. And, and wanted to kind of dig into that and some of the implications thereof. So, so I guess kind of, first of all, maybe just a little bit of the summaries of, of the challenges that you see security teams facing as part of the, the research that you did. Well, there are, there's no shortage of challenges, Jeff, and especially in this climate where because of the pandemic, we've had to move people to uh, working remotely. We've spun up a lot of cloud resources. So we've expanded the attack surface uh, we've added complexity to security, and of course, security can't get in the way of the business. Uh, yeah. Now, our research says that 40% of organizations have different infrastructure, uh, different security tools for different infrastructure. So, for instance, I've got my cloud security tools, I've got my network security tools, I've got my virtualization or VMware security tools, and that adds complexity, it adds cost, it adds redundancy. And one of the things we're seeing with this pandemic people are struggling with is policy management. So if I've got a policy in three different places, somehow I have to coordinate those, somehow I have to manage yeah. those, that doesn't scale. And so there, like I said, there's no shortage of challenges, but that's the acute challenge we're seeing right now. Right now, yeah, that, that makes sense. And, um, and, and you talked to, it's actually one of the things I found most interesting was I think you said 76% of organizations found that their time to detect and respond had actually increased over the past two years. And I guess that's a that's an implication of all the, the, the different tools and, and different attack surfaces, correct? Yeah, more data, yeah. Uh, more sophisticated attacks. We know that attacks are multi-phased through a kill chain, which is why we're leveraging the MITRE ATT&CK framework, for example. Yeah. Um, and then... It, it's it's people and skills too. I mean, this, this, as you know, this is a difficult thing. You have experts yeah. at Cisco who specialize in this. Well, if I'm a, a small manufacturing company in the Midwest or a, a seafood processing place here in New England, uh, I may not be able to recruit those people or have those people. So things are getting more difficult. Yeah, very good. And, and one, one thing that your research touches on is we in security, we've had a long history of you know, best of breed and best of breed products and tools, but you actually highlight some of the, the potential issues that strategy poses. You mind kind of elaborating on that a little more? No, not at all. So historically that was fine because these infrastructures grew organically. So we had, you know, AV and then we had web threats. We put a web gateway in place or an email gateway, um, but that just doesn't scale. So you've got disparate solutions, siloed solutions, what have you. Uh, we need tools for each of those. We need management for each of those. We need to train people on each of those. And then of course we need to somehow uh, amalgamate the data. Yeah, exactly. And we've relied on humans to do that. And, and goodness me, they, they've put in a <laughs> monumental effort. Um, but you, again, it, tribal knowledge or, or one person who's really good at this stuff doesn't scale. And of course, if that person leaves, yeah. that's problematic. Um, so the other interesting thing is that uh, we do some research with the Information System Security Association, ISSA, every year. 70% of organizations said they had a, uh, that this, the cybersecurity skill shortage impacted them. Yeah. And that's we asked them, well, what's the impact? 38% said, 
we deploy technologies, but we can't use them to their full potential. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that that situation is ex exacerbated if you've got multiple tools. tools yeah. So it's, it's scale, it's effectiveness. I mean, you, you must see this at Cisco as well. Yeah, I mean, we have, and I mean, frankly, <laughs> we we even contributed a bit to that that problem. You know, where frankly, we we hadn't historically, we didn't do a lot from an operational perspective to tie, you know, to provide you like visibility cross product, the ease at which you can bring context in between, and so that yeah, you know, that's actually been a, a huge huge focus of ours over the last couple of years, because we we heard so much. The focus around, you know, we are, I think we as a security industry have essentially made the customers and security teams like do a bunch of additional work to integrate because we didn't do that on their behalf. And that takes away the time and effort for them to kind of go after the highest value capabilities within their, within their team. So yeah, that makes sense. Um, so you know, kind of given, given you know, those concerns around all the different tools and teams, et cetera, like, you know, what are you telling CISOs? What are you, what are you kind of advising in terms of how they should think about a more integrated approach? It's interesting, Jeff, because uh, what we see from our research is that 86% of organizations believe that uh, integrating their technologies is either the top priority that they have or one of their top five priorities. So we don't really have to tell them <laughs> they're, they're there. getting it yeah, now yeah, where yeah. the struggle is okay well how do i do this and what do i do here and what we're saying is well let, let's take a step back and and really understand where are your bottlenecks yeah. is it a skills bottleneck is it a process bottleneck are you having trouble detecting threats are you having trouble responding to threats so those kinds of things are really important uh, you also have to look at where you are from an infrastructure perspective. So no one's going to take all their tools, rip them out and replace them with course, Cisco yeah. or any other vendor, right? So where, what's the starting place? Where's your pain point? And then how do you move forward from there? So it's a really kind of uh, detailed look at where you're starting from, mm -hmm. uh, what are your goals and objectives for as a, as a security organization and your security program, and then how do you implement these technologies to support that? And one other really important thing is, how can I support the business? Yeah. I mean, as a CISO, <laughs> that's my job is to enable the business. And therefore, it's not just security efficacy or operational efficiency. It's got to be, are there new applications I need to support? Are there new users I need to support? Are there threats that are particular to my industry or to my organization? Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're doing some research on uh, CISO's relationships with C-suites and the board. Well, that's exactly. all about risk yeah. management, right? Exactly. So how can, I, how can I lower my cyber risk? How can I get the metrics to communicate that I'm lowering my cyber risk? How can I build a program where I understand where my risks are and I build programs and exactly and measure yeah. my progress? Another topic I want to kind of get into. So the good news is you Sounds like she says, and you have some great data in terms of how many are looking at, at consolidation, either a major shift or a minor shift, and I think it's north of 75%. So how does this consolidation, you, how, how are you talking to CISOs about this consolidation approach, how they should think about things like integrated security platforms? Tell us a little bit about your counsel for them. You know, it, it, it really is important that they look at this from a long and a short term perspective. So you have to set the goals and the long term strategy, but you also need to understand what tool you're you're starting with, uh, how you'll implement that, get the constituencies on board. So for instance, get the security engineering team on board, get the network operations team on board, get the IT operations team on board. And to that extent you have to really work with the CIO, CIO because sure. this should improve should improve processes between security and IT ops it's and network the, ops. Yeah. So you want to do that. You want to build the coordinated processes. You want to assess how the processes are going today. And um, again, you really want to look at, well, where do I start? How do I get this going? Um, how am I going to measure success? So for instance, the, the thesis here is I start with one product 
I had a second product. The two work well together to do the yeah. one plus one equals more than two. All right, well, what's that more than two look like, Jeff? Does it mean reduction in, uh, in alerts? Does it mean faster time to detection and response? Uh, does it mean that analysts can do more investigations per day? And then once you've done that, how do you measure those things so that you sure. can fine tune your policy? And then longer term, you're going to add a third product, a fourth, and you want to make sure you're getting those incremental benefits. Go so that's, again, it's important to start up front with a plan, get buy-in from the constituencies, uh, and then really kind of cheerlead yeah. or lead this plan effectively. So it's it's a, there's a change management process to this is I think really what you're saying in terms of working across the different organizations within IT and security. That's right. And there's and you have to sell the long term benefit here, because, as you mentioned before, we have a culture of security professionals, CISSPs, who've been brought up thinking best of breed yeah. and they're going to resist. Now, if you're the CISO, you can mandate this, but you don't want to do that. You want buy in. And yeah. the buy in is, look, you can compare the ERP solutions, or not the ERP, the EDR solutions. You can compare the network traffic analysis solutions. Fine, but what we want to do is get to a uh, a whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Here's yeah. how we do it. Here's why we're doing it. Get that buy-in. And are there other specific benefits you're seeing CISOs look to and provide more they, they see more value in terms of maybe it's time to detection or it's, you know, lessening the burden on my staff. Are there certain ones that you see more commonly or is it really, really dependent on the individual firm and kind of where they are? It's, it's all over the board, but let me say that here's a commonality is better threat prevention. So we, we tend to kind of dwell on detection and response. Better threat prevention. Threat prevention is a quick win. Yeah, the further you get that. that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's basically reducing the attack surface, right? Yeah. Um, so I don't have to do as much. But then absolutely it is, it's, it's faster detection, but it's more thorough detection. As you mentioned before, right, a, a, a good state-sponsored cyber campaign is going to be low and slow, it's yeah, going to absolutely. try to fly under the radar. So I may not detect it on my endpoint alone or my network alone or my cloud alone or email or web or what have you. Yeah. It's the cumulative knowledge of understanding all of the steps that would go to conduct a cyber attack that are important. And um, Cisco's in the networking business and the network security <laughs> business is in your blood. Um, understanding what's going on in the network because the network is the connectivity or the traverses, tissue yeah, exactly. to everything, right? So when things are traversing the network, you have to know about them. And if you know what process on what endpoint started that, when that came in, what else it's doing, who else is talking, that's all, that's all really a cumulative thing. And again, we've, we've relied on people to do that, but we can't do that anymore. Yeah, no, that, and that's really interesting because our secure X threat hunting service and it's exactly the it's those low signal threats that it's really shown to be very effective at finding. So things where deceptions going on or you know basically pre deployment. There's the staging pieces that historically haven't been well identified by any single tool. So yep, these solutions. Uh, it's one thing to have better analytics and better visibility. It's another thing to be able to use these technologies for automation. So I need help finding and fetching the right data. I may need help um, quarantining a system. I may need help blocking further attacks. All of that is part of the process. And if we can take those tasks away from people, automate them, all the better. No, very cool. So last question from me, you may have some more for me, um, for me, but you know, so when you think about like going forward, you know, securing, you know, the future for our customers, other like key aspects you would like to highlight or think that they should be aware of as they look at this journey to a more consolidated or kind of platform approach. Solutions have to be easy to deploy. They have to be Absolutely. easy. Easy to use, but flexible, meaning my level one analysts get value out of it, 
yeah, and my most sophisticated analysts get out of it. I want an open that. solution, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And I want it to add value to my existing infrastructure. So Perfect. can you do all of those things? <laughs> We're working on it. So, and, and that's actually a pretty good segue. Um, in terms of like the approach we're taking with our platform, SecureX, you know, we started is no additional costs. So if you if you have invested in Cisco security, you get SecureX for no additional fee, quick time to value. Our, our stake in the ground is 15 minutes. You know, we hope that you, within 15 minutes, you'll be up and running. You'll have, you can have integrations with your existing Cisco portfolio and starting to see things in that. And then the, the one thing that I'm really excited about is the customizable aspect of it. So you know, we have over 70 different, we call them tiles that you come as part of that, that can be customized. So depending on your role and what you do, you'll hopefully be able to get the data that's most impactful for you on a daily basis. And that can kind of be the start point of your day. And then clearly you can drill in and be able to pivot across the different tools and technologies in the portfolio. So that's the, that's the, the absolute strategy for us going forward with uh, SecureX and what we're doing from a platform perspective. So with that. Open and. Uh, oh, oh, yeah, open, yeah, 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 absolutely. Open, sorry. Work open. with my SIM, all that stuff. Absolutely. So, you know, you'll see even out of the box um, integrations, SIMs, absolutely, you know, also IT tools. So things like ServiceNow, like I see a vulnerability in this endpoint. Can I automatically create a ticket? integrations into cloud platforms like AWS, Azure. So absolutely, and, and you're gonna see this, like we're just, we kind of came from a basis of threat response that was Cisco specific, and you're gonna see us do more and more um, with third parties going forward. Great, look forward to it. All right, perfect. Well, hey, John, thank you so much. Um, pleasure as always to spend time with you. Uh, I definitely, for folks who haven't seen it, John's research piece is really interesting. A ton. I mean, he even he barely scratched the surface in terms of the data that was there. So, John, thank you so much. Really appreciate the time. My pleasure. And with that, I will hand it back to Jason. Jason, take it away. All right. Thanks, guys. That was a great discussion. I, I heard a couple of great things that um, that that I would echo as well. I mean, obviously, a, a big change in the way that we deploy security with a lot more remote access happening these days in our current environment. Uh, but uh, simplifying policy management, simplifying the products in general, um, and and using some of our data for automation and better threat prevention, and then some of those those key last ones that we really hit on. Uh, that that uh, John really put us through our paces for. Uh, we want to be a partner with our customers, right? We don't want to just sell you a box and walk away. We want to be in, engaged and invested in in the success of enabling security. And um, so it, with that, it comes ease of use and deployment, and uh, be an open ecosystem to work with other third party technologies and um, and add add that value in in that direction. So. Guys, great discussion, fantastic. And I think I've got ways that I can show pretty much each one of those bullet points in our actual product. And that's what I love to do is actually show the technology and show a demonstration. So at this point, I'd like to shift gears and actually do a demo of SecureX and show you how we've been working to make everything much more simple, much more effective, much more automated, and take some of the burden off of the shoulders of people that have you know, these, all of these challenges that we just talked about. So at this point, I said, let's, let's switch over and take a look at the actual demo itself of SecureX. Okay, so as you can see here, we've logged into the SecureX interface here with our single sign-on. If I click in here, I'll get a, a multi-factor authentication challenge from Duo. And once we log in, you can see a beautiful dashboard that on the left-hand side is showing us some of the technologies that we've deployed and that we have uh, uh, available at our disposal. But one of the first things I wanna talk about is the integrations and third-party connectivity. As John Oldsick talked about, leverage the existing infrastructure and work with what, what we already have and create value. So we can show you that we're going to be doing that heavily and, and making sure that we're focusing on some of those third-party applications. You see some of our integrations here. If I go into the actual applications, I can see a whole range of, of uh, vendors and technologies that we can use, whether they're threat hunting feeds or SIM solutions or ticketing, 
uh, type of, of solution. So all of these technologies are things that we're working with and we'll be supporting dozens of vendors and continuing this list at, to, uh, and growing and expanding over time. But let's move back over to, into the dashboard. And when we start off, what we're uh, really aiming to do here is simplify the security through this kind of orchestration and automation. And so we can set up the ability to run these playbooks that will respond to certain incidents that we see in our environment and start to, to really take some of the burden off the shoulders of our, our security administrators. So let's start off with creating a new workflow here. And we'll go ahead and uh, get this titled with a data exfiltration response so that we can uh, set something up to respond to certain events that we see. And as we move over here into the left, we can start dragging uh, different groups in to create a, a, a flow and an outline. So we'll start this off with an incident response and incident assignment. So when we see a problem, let's, let's kick off this flow by assigning the incident. And as we follow through and build out our, our movement and direction of what we're going to do, we can see that we'll have some investigation, we'll take some snapshots and do some threat response act, actions, and then even kick off some of those more uh, third-party integrated uh, uh, communications with opening to service tickets and communicating what's going on with the rest of our team here. So let's move in now to some of the individual functionalities that you see on the left hand side. If we look down here at Cisco threat response with CTR, we can start off with by creating uh, an incident assignment, right? So we'll identify who is responsible for responding to this particular event. And then we'll add in some additional functionalities about grabbing some more observables, learning a little bit more about the environment, and even creating a snapshot from either CTR or Orbital or both. In this case, we can add uh, Orbital forensic snapshot here to take a look at the uh, endpoint or what's uh, exactly what's happening with this problem. And then, like I said, start to uh, deliver some automatic uh, creation of service tickets and communications within ServiceNow and even within uh, WebEx Teams as well. So now we've got a nice flow of what we want to do when we see a certain incident and we can save this and run this. And now back at the dashboard, which is giving you a beautiful view of not just the products that you have, but some of the key statistics that we have seen and watching our burn down rates. But what we see on the right hand side are a few different interesting events. And so one here is the threat hunting incident where we're doing some threat hunting and, and integrating some information there. That's interesting, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But what's even more interesting is that potential data exfiltration alert. Now, that has actually kicked off a few automated activities that you see down here at the bottom right, where we've assigned the incident, we've created uh, a ticket and assigned it to a, a incident responder. And this is all executing the playbook that we just created. So if we expand this, we'll see even a little bit more information about this particular alert. It looks like StealthWatch Cloud has identified some communication to a, a, a known bad server in China. We have see on the bottom left here, the actual playbook running step by step that we created in the previous screen, right? So now we're moving from the, the enabling of, the, of that automation through the orchestration to unifying the visibility across all of these different technologies. And now I can start to investigate and get into the actual response of that. Here, this takes me into Cisco Threat Response and maps out what we've seen here with a malicious SHA-256 that came down to an endpoint before he started communicating to a, uh, a malicious website there. So first thing I may wanna do is isolate that endpoint. I can start my host isolation. Now I see our endpoint security technology has acknowledged that that endpoint has been locked down. And as we move forward, I may want to say, let's make sure that nobody else goes to that, that URL and that domain. So here I can block this domain and our secure internet gateway is going to be able to make sure that we've got that domain blocked and nobody else, whether they're on or off the network, will be able to, uh, to be able to access that domain. So we've protected the whole network, identified the threat, protected the whole network and isolated the offending host all within a matter of seconds here in real time. So if we take a look at some of the other aspects of this as we're, we're moving across our workflow, earlier you remember that threat hunting incident where we saw some 
information that uh, that we were looking for. Maybe it was a TELUS blog or maybe a CVE entries or maybe some other threat hunting information sources. So we started to scan and see where we might see some of that activity within our network. And sure enough, Orbital is saying, hey, yeah, one of those IP addresses is communicating uh, out to this uh, malicious IP address. So we'll want to make note of that. But you'll also notice that as I'm moving across multiple products here, the, the SecureX ribbon down here at the bottom is staying with me. So I can always bounce back to individual interfaces or straight back to the dashboard, which is what I'll do here after we see a little bit of information that's happened here on the threat scan. So once now we've moved back and you, you've seen a whole host of, of information. Number one, we've seen a lot of third-party integration to help you leverage your existing investments out there. Working with these other technologies is absolutely key. We know we don't do everything in the world and we're not trying to boil the ocean, but we're trying to integrate and simplify. We've created a unified level of visibility here across all of your security technologies, all of them working together. And even as you're moving across different interfaces from your internet gateway to your email security gateway to your endpoint technologies, we're staying with you and facilitating the movement across all of those through this SSO login uh, capability that we've created here. And then finally, enabling that automation, that is going to, to allow us to take a lot of that burden off of the shoulders of IT administrators. There's too much going on out there for us to try to do all this stuff manually. So let's, let's let the technology do what the technology does best and start to respond automatically when we see certain things. And there's lots of other use cases that you can look into about uh, uh, monitoring our VPN usage or uh, identifying Office 365 IP addresses that you'll want to enable in your firewall policies. All of these types of things can be enabled in an automated fashion and a customized fashion, in addition to the templates that we have. And so the end result of all of that is that we're strengthening your security, we're simplifying the things that you have to do on a regular basis, and trying to make it a, a, a faster time to detect, a time to respond, and integrate with what you've got. And that's what SecureX is bringing to the table, and that's why it's such an exciting product. So if you want to learn a little bit more about this technology, obviously you can always go to cisco.com slash go slash SecureX. As I mentioned, this is integrated and comes with any Cisco security technology. So you already have access to it. Just log in and start using it. It's very easy to set up and you'll start to see the value of it immediately. I'm quite certain. That was awesome. Now to end today, we've got a great customer fireside chat with Lou Saviano from Skillsoft and Steve Martino, who's the CISO for Cisco. Now for attendees watching live, remember to ask questions in the Q&A panel and on social media, and our team is standing by to answer them. So with that, let's listen to the great fireside chat. Hey Lou, it's good to see you again. Before we jump into the dialogue and this discussion we're gonna have today, can you tell us a little bit about what Skillsoft is and what your role is there uh, at Skillsoft? Hi, Steve. Nice to see you again also. Uh, my role at Skillsoft is I'm the Vice President of Global IT. And Skillsoft is an e-learning company. We have online books, online training. We also do succession planning from the HR and competencies. So we have a broad range and depth of different kinds of content that we provide. And my role pretty much is anything that has to do with the employee. And I also do a lot of the CISO type of role, even that isn't though my formal title. And I also do a lot of the data protection and privacy and work closely with legal and HR. That's awesome. And I think uh, that whole industry around training, online training, remote training is gonna be even more important in the days going forward. So that's, that's, uh, that's really great. Um, as we jump into it, um, uh, we've seen a lot of change in the last couple of months uh, with COVID, with uh, remote workers, uh, new security threats, uh, new business models that we're sort of adjusting to. Um, how has that impacted your role at Skillsoft and what are you doing to support the business going forward? I believe the opportunity, what I've observed is IT, by the nature of what we do, we have to be very proactive. We've always had disaster recovery and failover, and making sure that no one in IT was single-threaded. So 
I believe this COVID virus gave us the opportunity to be a, more of a trusted advisor to the business because it's just nature of how we work. In some businesses, not just Skillsoft, but in general, I've been talking to other companies too, is they may or may not have understood a possible gaps they've had because, you know, the focus of the business and the nature of how it works versus, you know, a typical IT organization. So I think we've been able to show them and right from the go when we started working everybody from home we were the best positioned of anybody in the company to do that seamlessly yeah that's awesome i think the business is uh also transforming and and you know people were doing more online all the time and as we do more and more remote work and i think many corporations have realized they can function in a remote environment how do you think that's going to affect uh, Skillsoft and the security uh, of Skillsoft's customers, products, uh, and delivery to your to your customers. I think the Skillsoft business, like you were saying before, because of being an online company, and pretty much we're about fifty percent of remote workers already. We're well positioned, and and I think the demand and I agree is going to be even higher in the future. I think from a supporting our customers, a lot of our customers, both internally and externally, we're already in a hybrid world. In fact, you know, a lot of our business systems too were, you know, in the cloud. And then our customers in particular working on our cloud solutions and then interacting with us any different way, you know, in this whole collaborative world. So I think more than ever, the security is a high priority to them. I'm getting more questions than ever, and I'm getting a broader range and in depth, especially. It's no longer just a checklist answer, which I'm happy about. I think we needed to get beyond that. And I think the even more that I had to rely on my vendors to have a complete solution. Any visibility gaps I have in this new world is, you know, I think it's going to be a bigger exposure than ever before. Yeah, yeah, I think that uh, makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, like Skillsoft, I think Cisco was also in a good position to move to a re work from remote worker kind of environment. Uh, about 80% of our employees had all the capabilities to work remotely uh, when this hit. So there was a few that we had to scale up and, and support. But then it's really about how you adjust um, how people work, how you lead differently through um, a remote worker environment versus a on-prem environment and some of those kinds of things. And I'm sure you, you and your company have experienced some of that as well. Um, moving forward, I think one of the things that has really helped um, a lot of companies or really impacted a lot of companies is um, planning for the unknown. And as you said a little bit ago, um, we always did disaster planning, but most of our disaster planning was, you know, a tornado hit or a tsunami or we lost power. And, and so what did we need to do there? Um, but I think what this has really done in the mode that I talk to a lot of peers in the industry is how do we plan for the unknown? How do we deal with things that we just couldn't anticipate? And what can we do today to do, deal with those unknowns? How are you approaching that? It's two major factors. 50% I consider the user and 50% technical. So the 50% of the user, um, if I have a good culture of the company I'm working for, oh, that's you know important, it has to flow from top down. It's not a bottom up culture from a security and data protection. And then security awareness training, which luckily at Skillsoft, we do that so that works. It's a lot of load off my plate for us, security awareness training. I do a lot of phishing exercises and again, I simplify it. I rate my employees either low, medium, or high risk users. And right now, almost, we're almost 100% low risk users. So that program is working too. And, you know, people take pride in it. Now, the 50% technical, that's where I focus on the landscape, the Cisco tools, et cetera. And plus, even of that, most of it, I look at it as the web front end, the browsers, the interfaces. Very rarely now are we putting you know, fat clients on the desktop. So it's really everything through the web, which in yep. has changed our, our threat landscape. And then again, how I use your tools. 
And so to me, that makes it a little simplified. If, if I look at this from all the different angles, it gets too complex. And then it becomes hard for my people to understand too. And also I can't speak intelligently to the business leaders. I have to be able to talk to the executives and the boards and that ELT and make it easily understandable, make, you know, give them the confidence we have it under control. And if it's a very complex conversation, then we both lose it. So again, this is the need for the simplification, at least in my mind. Yeah, I think that's a great point. I try to do that. I think of it almost like I'm a translator. I have to translate from one context to another to another. And and it, as part of that, it's making it uh, simple and understandable for whoever I'm I'm talking to. Speaking of which, as we t sort of transition a little bit here, um, I know you've been a Cisco customer, a Cisco security customer. Um, how is Cisco helping you transform Skillsoft uh, and uh, and improve the security and and uh, trustworthiness of your company? There's a couple different angles where the Cisco suite has been able to help me, and plus your resources, especially the, I would say the last a uh, couple of years, especially um, either, you know, whatever way it's happened, I've, I've gotten to work more and more with you and others and your security people. So it's been a, you know, huge help. But so the resources I have have to be as efficient as possible. And to me, I hate spending any time on run and maintain type of activities unless forced to. So my goal is to minimize run and maintain and do stuff that's helping to grow and transform our company. And to do that, I have to have our people freed up from doing menial tasks. So working with your people, understand where your products are going, what they can do today, and even making sure that we're properly using them, that automates a lot of those processes. So then when we get an alert or we think that something's happening to in our environment, we can jump on it quicker. We can make a better determination if it's a real incident or not, which at the end of the day is my responsibility to the company and to our customers, if there's an incident, determining what level that is and reacting and communicating as fast as possible. And I believe, especially with the SecureX and the integration of your products, I'm going to be better positioned to do that. Um, and so then I'm going to be able to give within a certain period of time business that what is really happening. So that now the ELT can make the proper decisions on what we have to do. Um, that that's that's that to me is key and also simplifying i can't have tools either in, either from the same company or multiple companies if i want to do a simple thing of blocking a bad site i have to go into 10 different tools and use 10 different people integrate the tools it can't be that hard so when i do a block if i'm in my casby or I'm in my firewall whatever it blocks it and not everybody then tries if we unblock it we have to remember if we unblocked it versus waiting for the business user to open a help desk call that something's not working. It's just embarrassing, I think, in general of our profession if we can't do a simple task of blocking something to one tool. I think that's uh, those are all great things, and it connects back to your simplicity, um, uh, the reduced time to detect and, and contain whatever threats you're having and make sure that the efficacy of those uh, are really, really high. I've always... Um, put that those metrics at the top of my security uh, chart along with one other, which is um, am I managing my environment, patching and vuln management and all those things. Uh, if I'm doing that and I can detect and contain a threat, um, I'm probably going to not be on the headline of many newspapers uh, very often. So uh, uh, I really appreciate your uh, your comments around that and they match and gel very much. I know we have a, a time limit. I want to run into a couple of last couple of quick questions for you. Um, uh, you're a, like me, a, a, a gray haired, uh, <laughs> uh, long time veteran in the IT world. Um, uh, if you were to share one experience that you have had uh, over your career with someone uh, that's new to the industry or you know, not as gray and, and uh, experienced as you and I, um, what would that one lesson be that you'd want them to know and, and, and take away? I would want them to know if you want to be good in 
this business and one of the reasons why I believe a lot of the best people in this business do have gray hair is <laughs> the complexity. I love the complexity as far as I love to learn. I love a challenge and it, it takes time. There's multiple different in fact, as this is happening as far as the endpoints and the networks and um, governments attacking my company and others on a daily basis. And this is not something to learn overnight. And then you can't be just a technical closet person. I was a Unix guru previously, and then I was into artificial intelligence. And then then I got into the business side. It takes that whole cross section of experiences and abilities to do this job right. The best CISOs I know in this business have all those different views, and then they leverage the resources within the department and across the company, and then we mentor. And I, and I believe everybody should be a good mentor. If I was going to say anything while you're learning, look for a mentor, and then someday pay it forward as soon as possible. That's how I think we've become the best at this business, and plus you'll be happier in the end. That's a great answer. And, and the last thing I want to ask you about is, and you mentioned the Cisco partnership. I appreciate your partnership. I appreciate you being a big customer of Cisco and willing to spend some time talking with uh, all of our customers and me today. Um, but I think that those partnerships are critical and having those, those uh, few people that you can trust and those organizations that you can trust. Um, how would you share uh, to our audience today um, what that Cisco partnership and relationship meant to you and how should they best exploit that? To me, part of being a trusted partner is I share everything with my trusted partners or with Cisco as far as projects and my challenges and sometimes when I'm upset with something and sometimes when I'm happy and I'm just open about it. To me, that's the level what I get out of the relationship in. It's really beyond the technical pieces. To me, a lot of the times, the technical pieces is the easy part. A partnership is saying, okay, man, this didn't go good. Well, I have some couple of people I can help you. It's not about another license or it's another about I'm not trying to sell you something else. And the same thing on my end. I can get back to you and say, yeah, I know you think the tool is doing this, but in the real world, I'm seeing this. And you say, oh, great. Or I'd say, you know what? I was able to do this. I noticed someone's machine was being compromise before we even saw it in the endpoint solution, leveraging the CASB, and it's like, well, wait a minute, think about that. Because at the end of the day, some of these tools have the capabilities to do stuff that we may not know of what it was designed to, but it becomes a side benefit. So I think us working together makes the tools better and relationship better. I've known you for a little while, and all of those words are exactly the way that you work with us and live your life. And I really appreciate you taking time today with us uh, to share your thoughts and insights with our customers and very much for being a partner of Cisco and letting us be your partner. Thanks a lot, Lou. Um, to Thank the you. whole audience, uh, take care and have a good day. Wow, what an incredible way to spend the day. Thank you to everyone watching and for spending part of your day with us. We hope that you found it informative, inspirational, and that we share some practical tips to help make your day job in cybersecurity a little bit better. Yeah, when we talk about SecureX, we're really talking about integration. The integration gives us additional visibility, it gives us automation, and that gives you time back with your teams, your loved ones, and to be able to do your job more effectively. So if you want to learn more about SecureX, definitely stop by our website at cisco.com slash go slash SecureX. Yes, absolutely. And remember to check out our new Simplify to Secure report too. There's also loads of information on the SecureX Cisco.com page too. Thank you so much for staying with us and joining our broadcast and have a great rest of your day. Okay, so here we go. I want to talk about real news. So let's talk about what we're going to launch today. Here we go. All of you have made some pretty amazing things possible over the years. We got WebEx, we got TP, we can do it wherever we like. Oh, hey, how are you? 
human. Be human, remain that, connect with others. Connectivity and information is really a form of aid in and of itself. This is what it's all about. This is why we do what we do.